Hello everyone and welcome to video lecture 2, already getting stuck into the exciting stuff. In this video we are going to be looking at how to apply ArcViz techniques in Unreal Engine, but it is important that you are watching the video lectures first. You'll notice that this is a very long video and that is because I fully intend you break it up into chunks. So before you have a go at lighting in Unreal Engine, you must watch the lighting video lecture first so that you understand lighting. Before you have a go at materials, watch the materials and the color lecture first. Before you add assets in Unreal Engine, make sure you understand assets and how they work first. So I do fully intend you break this video up into chunks watch it as you need to watch it pause it fast forward it rewind it stop it come back to it the next day whatever you need to do to set the pace of your learning for you go ahead and do it just make sure that you are watching the video lectures as well i know it sounds like chris now you're making me watch twice the amount of videos but it is important in this video we're only really looking at the specific techniques of unreal engine whereas the other video lectures go through the big picture understanding of how these things actually work and why we're doing what we're doing at the end of the day softwares come and go but having that fundamental knowledge having that understanding of how and why we do what we do that will carry you through into any practice and beyond into the future all right enough lecturing from me let's go ahead and get stuck in to the techniques of ArcViz inside Unreal Engine all right before we even get into lighting assets camera direction etc in Unreal I want to come back out to YouTube once again, to remind you all, I know I've mentioned it a few times now, of my favorite video tutorials for learning Unreal Engine. This guy in particular, William Forcher, all-time favorite. But this video in particular is my favorite of the favorites. Lighting for beginners in Unreal takes us through everything we need to know to make our lighting look very, very special, convincing, and photo real. Very important, must, must, must watch this video. It's 40 minutes, watch it at two times speed, you get it through in 20. He's gonna hit a lot of the same things I'm gonna go through now, but in more detail. I'm gonna do my best to get you off to a good base point, but it's important that you do go out and do your own research into other different videos. Another thing I wanna show you is my favorite Unreal videos. I've put them all in a little list here. Uh, starting from the bottom, so understanding Nanite, this is a big thing that lots of people that want to use Unreal uh, want to wrap their head around, so understanding that is good, how it's going to help you with your modeling down the line. My favorite, lighting, understanding GPU light mass, which is one of the plugins we enabled in the last video, the difference between Lumen and HDRI, when we're going to use what, uh, Nanite for foliage so that it runs faster, makes uh, trees were always the biggest problem for us, so enabling Nanite for the trees is going to make things a lot better how to do your landscaping, more on Lumen. Unreal Engine 5 for beginners, LODs and Nanite. The big one for this is understanding LODs, which just means level of detail. The beauty of using a game engine is that it knows, because when you're playing a game, you want the same thing to happen, that if you're standing a kilometer away from an object down the line, yes, we want to be able to see it. We want to see that we're walking towards that, but we don't need to see it at 8K resolution from a kilometer away. So what LODs do is they say, okay, based on my proximity to objects, I'm going to increase or decrease the resolution so that my machine can run faster. So understanding your LED is very, very useful, uh, making sure things run effectively. Foliage and trees, very useful as well. Um, ugly shadows, this comes from turning nanites on on specific objects like rocks, trees, etc. That's good to understand. Volumetric clouds, so you can actually change the clouds and make them look the way you want them to look. Uh, 50 tips for Unreal, pretty good. I like the fact that it's just a round robin, shows a bunch of different things. Collisions, this is going to be a real frustration for a lot of different people, making sure that when you import something in that we can't just walk straight through it if we're in the model pathway. Perfect example, which is why I like this one, is stairs. Obviously, we actually want to walk up the stairs. We don't just want it to be a, a block cube wall as a collision either. So this just explains how to add collisions to your static meshes once you bring them in and then how to migrate content between projects. So once you get to the end and you wanna be able to share between your group, between your team members, this is how you can migrate stuff from place to place. Again, we're all just learning Unreal together. Unreal Engine 5 has only been out for a little while now. So I will be adding to this as I go. I'll make sure these are all on Blackboard as well. And then if you find anything interesting, make sure you send it back to me. Send me an email with the YouTube link and I'll add that to the database for everybody so that we can all learn together at the same pace. The more we can help each other, the better we can get and the faster we can get over these pinch points. 
All right, so we're back in Unreal now. I'm gonna talk about lighting first. All I have in here that's different from a first person template is I've just imported my Rhino file. You can see the textures materials are not set yet. This is just arbitrary stuff directly from Rhino. Everything else is as per your default screen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start deleting stuff that I don't need. I don't need any of these blocks in here. So click on all of that, delete those, delete and don't need the cylinder cool delete delete those as well and you just go ahead and do the same thing just go ahead and delete all of the stuff that you don't need uh, leave in stuff that says bp next to it the blueprint that is going to have your first person stuff inside there and uh, everything else we're set to delete and simulated cubes delete all right, now I have deleted everything. All you should have is your Rhino file, which we can hide up here as well. We've got player start and some bits from our first person. And then we've got our lighting folder. Now you might be surprised here, but we're actually gonna delete everything in the lighting folder and start again from scratch so that we've got more control over what's going on. So grab everything, hit delete even grab the lighting folder and go delete as well to make sure everything's gone. And we're gonna go ahead and bring our own lighting into here. Okay, so we've deleted all of that. What we're gonna do first is go up into window and then we're gonna go to environment light mixer, this one here. That might come up as a little tab, something like this. Just grab it, click it and bring it down to your content browser tab. And that way you can open it up in full. Then what we need to do is go from minimal to normal so that we can see everything we need to see. First, we're gonna add a skylight and then click on real time capture. Next, we'll create an atmospheric light and that is our sun, which we'll get to the sun in a little bit. Then we want a sky atmosphere. We want some volumetric clouds and we want a height fog as well. Then we've got a couple of settings we need to edit before we do anything. We're gonna go into directional light. We're gonna type in occlusion. We're gonna turn on light shaft occlusion. What that does is it's gonna allow those delicious god rays to come in through here. So we'll definitely need those on for later. Leave that for now. Then we'll go over to our volumetric height fog, which is down the bottom. Last one we added, scroll all the way down and type in volumetric. And then we're gonna turn on volumetric fog. And that is just gonna allow the density of the fog to gather in the light. Again, gonna be helpful for us for later. And then we can get back out of that and scroll back up to the top. So that is all the lights that we need to add inside our scene. And already we've done nothing to the materials. We've done nothing to anything yet. And the lighting is looking pretty good. We've got some good depth of field. We've got some good shadow running through here. And it's got all these ugly reflections on that I don't even want, but it's still looking okay-ish. So now we can start to edit our sun. So the sun is the directional light. That's all it means. It's coming from a specific direction. That's what the sun does, right? So we can click on the directional light and there's a bunch of settings we're gonna have a look at in due course. For now, just click inside the viewport. Then I want you to hit control L and then keep control L held down and then just start to move your mouse around. And you'll notice that this plays with the sun's position in the sky. So we can go all the way down low and that's gonna give us a nighttime scene. We can go just on the horizon. That's gonna give us sunrise slash sunset. We can pull it all the way up to the top, which will give us something around noon. And then we can move it around east, west, north, south, whatever direction that we want. So this is how we control our sun. Control L, holding that down, and then just moving our mouse into the position that we're looking for. Last week we talked about levels. A really useful reason to have a level is because you want your sun to be in different positions when you get to different scenes. So that way you can highlight the space. You might want it coming from directly from above to highlight an oculus uh, in one scene and then you might want it coming from lower down to the side so that you can have some streaking light coming in in another scene using levels allows you to control that and something else what we want to do now is just edit some of the project settings so if we go up to edit project settings and then we're just going to type in shadow up the top here and we're going to turn on our ray trace shadows if you happen to have a graphics card which is RTX NVIDIA, you'll be able to use this one. If not, don't worry, it won't change too much in terms of your settings. And this one up here, the debug canvas enable text shadow. And we'll see that that is adding a little bit more atmosphere into our scene here. We're starting to get a little bit of that God ray effect of some of that light catching in 
the atmosphere around the place here. The next thing we'll notice is that the lighting is a little bit too constant. It's a little bit too perfect. And that is because our exposure is being automatically adjusted to whichever way we're looking. So we're looking out here away from the direction of the sun, but that would still be a very bright sky coming through here. Then we're inside the space and we can see already it is making this brighter inside here. That should be much darker inside the space that we're standing in at the moment. And then this is all level as well. And it's flattening everything out for us, so we don't want that. So what we're gonna do is create our first post-process volume. Over in your Actors tab, come over to Visual Effects, this one here, and then click on Post-Process Volume and drag that into your scene. Then go over to Post-Process Volume in your uh, Outliner. And then we're gonna go down to the Details tab then all we're going to do is type in infinite. There we go. And then we're just going to click on infinite extent unbound. And so what this does is it means it doesn't matter where we put this post process volume it can be anywhere inside the entire model. It's going to apply it universally. So whatever settings we make, we don't need to make sure that this is in exactly the right pinpoint location. We can do that if we want, if we want it to just happen inside one volume. But typically what I'll do is prefer to just run this everywhere in the model. And then something that I want to change with a different post process, I will put that on a different level. Inside our post process, we're going to use this to control our exposure. So rather than exposure being done automatically by the software, we're going to just set our own exposure inside here. So close these ones up go down to exposure, turn on metering mode. We're going to change it from automatic into manual. It's going to go black, don't worry. Exposure compensation, turn on. Apply physical camera exposure, turn on, and then uncheck the box next to it so it goes to false. And we'll see what it's done here is while it looks darker and not as good as we had it before, this is actually a lot more realistic. We can see that it's much darker in here, the shadows are much darker, and it's all at one level. So as we're walking around, it's not automatically adjusting as we go. This space outside here with that bright, bright sky should be significantly brighter than the space that we're standing in covered, protected at the moment. So turning on an exposure through post-process volume is gonna give you a much more realistic experience as you're navigating around your model and as we're taking renders inside the model. Whichever pathway you're doing, it'll be a lot more realistic with manual exposure turned on. Now that we've got that post-processing volume turned on with our exposure, we can start editing our sun and making sure it looks the way we want it to look. So that is the directional line. What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn up the intensity for now. Let's turn that up to 100. And we can see what that does in terms of the spatial quality, in terms of that light now coming all the way through the space, in terms of that running through here. Might be a little bit too bright. We don't have materials on, so lighting isn't gonna be perfect yet because it doesn't know what to bounce off. It doesn't know where to make shadow, where to bounce light and reflect that for now because this is all coming straight from Rhino, but we can already start to see that the qualities are moving in the right directions. We're getting some nice shadows falling on the floor here. We're getting some dark areas, some bright areas from the direction of the sun. That's looking pretty good. We can also start to play with the exponential height fog as well. So these two are directly correlated. So changes you make in the exponential height fog are gonna change directional light. Directional light is gonna change exponential height fog, and both of them are gonna be affected by the post-process volume. Effectively, the way to think about it is all of the lighting interacts with each other. So you can't change one without going back in and changing some more. So let's have a look at our exponential height fog. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up the density of the fog so that you can start to see what this is actually doing. So instead of 0 0.02, I'm going to turn this up to 2, which is 200 times. And you can see oh, all of a sudden it's filled this thing in with fog. Fog is particles particles catch light and so it's going to get brighter and brighter inside the scene. If I turn that down to 0.2 we'll be able to see that it's getting a little bit dimmer now, it's not so bright. But there's still way too much fog going on inside that space. If we turn that down to 0.1 that'll half that again and let's try it at 0.05 down there. So what we're doing is we're now creating a sense of atmosphere in the space. We can see that what's closest to us, that's really uh, crisp and sharp. And what gets further away from us gets blurrier and less visible, which again is adding a sense of realism. It also means we're going to be able to play more with the different lighting conditions that come through. And once again, you can test what these things look like with and without and try and get those conditions working for you. I would say width is working better, it's too much, but it's still much better than being able to see all that horizon over there and everything being quite flat. So we know that we're on the right track, we just have some more adjusting to do. 
what I want to do is I'm going to come back into my directional light and the sunlight here and I'm going to come down to volumetric scattering intensity. What this does is it's telling us how we're going to interact with that fog that we've put in there. So if I increase this one here, let's say I put this up to 10, it looks like it has a very similar effect to just increasing the density on our height fog. If I bring that up to 20, it looks very much the same. What we can do is we come up to our exponential height fog and I'm gonna bring down the fog density to 0 0.00245, which is a number I like for this particular scene. Then I'm gonna go back into my directional light and my scattering intensity, I'm going to bring that up to Let's try 40, let's try 100. Yeah, so what that does is it's a little bit different to just turning the fog up and down. It's playing more with how the light actually interacts with the fog itself. You'll find that having a lower fog intensity but a higher scattering in your directional light will typically give you better results. But again, we haven't done anything to our materials yet. So this is just going to be early days. We feel like we're heading in the right direction. We feel like the sun's doing what we want it to do. If we hold down control L, we play with our sunlight again. As the sun kind of maps through this space and comes around, roughly it's doing what we want it to do. So I've tweaked around a bit now and I'm pretty happy with how this is looking and that is really the process with playing with your directional light, your exponential height fog and your exposure inside your post process volume. And I'll show you those settings in a second. What I've been chasing is I'm trying to get this natural looking god ray coming through here. That's the important bit. The rest of it we can tweak and, and play around with. We can brighten up the shadows, we can make it brighter inside the space but just getting the subtlety of this working. So if I come up to my directional light, we can see currently I'm on intensity is 100. I've brought my indirect lighting down to zero because I want that darkness in the shadows, the full depth of shadow. And I brought my volumetric scattering intensity up to 10. My exponential height fog I've set at back at standard because I like the subtlety of this. Now if I want to, I can pump it up by just a little bit and that will make it a little bit more intense, but the subtlety is nice for me, I think at the moment that's doing what I want it to do. And then the last one for me, as you'll notice, this is quite a bit darker, is I've brought my post-process volume down to negative. So I've got a negative exposure of negative 0.9 at the moment. And another thing that I've done is in my directional light, if you search for ray tracing, I've actually disabled my ray tracing for now because I'm happy with the way it looks. If I turn this back on, go to enabled, I'm blowing out a little bit. Again, of course, I can go back in and adjust all these settings so that it works with the ray tracing and it's doing what it wants to do. But for me, for now, with the look that I'm going for, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this and I'll continue adjusting that as I go through. Now that I'm pretty happy with the exterior lighting, it's going in the direction that I'm looking for, what I wanna do is bake the lighting. By default, my lighting quality is set to preview, which is the lowest setting. What I'm gonna do is put this up to either high or production. For me on my graphics card, production is gonna be fine. For you, you might need to sit down a little bit lower. I'm gonna to go to production, then I'm gonna go back up again. I'm gonna go down to GPU light mass, and I'm gonna build in my lighting. I've got two options here. I can either bake exactly what I see. So if I just wanna render out quickly just this viewport and see what the final lighting is gonna look like, I can do just that. Or if I'm ready, I think, yeah, I'm pretty confident this might be okay. I don't mind if it takes a little while. I'm gonna do a full bake, then you can do that. You can do build lighting, and that will build all of your lighting. And then if you want to speed it up a little bit, you can turn off the viewport real time, and that will build it in the background. I can see that went a whole lot quicker down here. It's telling me how long it's taking. That's building all of the lighting in for us. Light build is complete. Real time has been automatically turned back on for us. And there we go, we've got some lighting. So I can see the shadow is looking a little bit deeper. We're seeing where the sun is starting to catch on there. We're seeing some of that reflected light coming back up into this vault up here. It's looking better. It's definitely moving in the direction that I want. And I'm ready to now start looking at artificial lighting as well. Before we get to artificial lighting, what I wanna do is jump ahead a little bit to where I've already got some materials in place because it does make it easier to do the artificial lighting and you'll probably do it that way in your workflow anyway. You're sick of looking at these rough materials coming straight from Rhino, so you wanna put your materials in before you bother doing any artificial lighting. 
perfectly normal. So what we'll do now is we'll jump ahead a little bit, we'll have a look at where my materials are already in place, we'll put some artificial lighting in place so that you can see how it works, and then once we've had a play around with that, we'll go ahead and learn how to put materials into your model as well. All right, so here we are in a scene that is already full of materials just so that we can have a look at lighting and then of course we'll jump back to materials in a bit. Lighting in Unreal Engine is very similar to lighting in Twin Motion. Same principles, the same types of light. We've got a directional light which is probably most similar to your spherical light inside Twin Motion, which is a big round sun. We've got point lights which will do something similar but from a distance and then of course have no light on the back of them. A spotlight is a spotlight and a rectangular light is a rectangular light, all very, very similar to Twin Motion. A skylight and an HDRI, we know what they are as well from Twin Motion videos, but these are the main three types of lights that we would be bringing in when we're experimenting in Unreal Engine. So what I'll do now is I'm going to turn off my sky and my sun and start to bring some of these artificial lights in so that you can see how they work. Typically, when we're doing artificial lighting in Unreal, it's going to be when, say for example, we don't actually want the chiaroscura and we want to be able to see what's going on here. So we could bring some extra artificial lighting to put onto that. Or it would be we want to do some key lighting. So we've got a character in the foreground. There's lots of light around. But we also want to bounce some soft light off their face so that we can bring them um, to the fore or it's a detail in your architecture that you want to bring to the fore rather than a character. That is the type of thing that we'll be adding artificial lighting in, as well as our interior scene. So if you've got any interior scene that's just not getting that much sunlight inside the space, the skylight's not making its way through, and you find yourself adding too much ambient light to just try and fill it, exactly the same principle as Twin Motion. We're putting artificial lights in there so that it feels more realistic rather than just bumping up the mid-tones and making everything look flat. All right, let's turn these off. So I'm turning the sun off first, then I'm gonna turn off my skylight. I've got a little spotlight there as well. I'll turn that off for now so we can start from darkness. And we see that everything turns off. This is what we want. And we know that we're controlling the automatic exposure here because otherwise that would kick in and it would be adding light here. So make sure you've got your post-process volume turned on if that is not happening for you. All right, let's add some lights. Remember directional light is our sun, so we're not gonna add another sun into the scene. We'll go ahead and grab a point light, which is a typical light. When we're in Unreal, it's looking for something for you to put the light onto, right? And that is what ultimately it's going to give its direction to start with. And so if you're like me and you've got a bunch of odd geometries, it's going to create some odd angles. If you've got a nice flat ceiling, that'll work a little bit better for you. But it doesn't matter. You can just kind of put it somewhere in the scene and you'll get it roughly to what you're looking for. So let's say for now, I want to put it on this one here. So once you've done that, obviously it's started to work out the shadows now, it looks a little bit better. From here, I can move the light around just like anything else in my scene. So the point light, as we said, doesn't have a back to it. So it's gonna throw most of its light down and then we'll get some light reflecting back up off the floor, back off whatever it is from there in space. And then really you're just massaging it around, moving it to the point you want to have it in. So we can keep moving it around until we're happy with it. We'll notice that the shadows update in real time. Once we've got it roughly in the position that we're looking for, obviously I'd push mine further back. I don't want all this uh, white out coming off that material there, but for now it's fine. You get the picture. We've got a few things to edit down here in the details tab. So of course the intensity is gonna be the intensity, very much the same as Twin Motion. If I turn this up to 100, it's gonna blow it out, which it has. And then we can bring that back down. I've got the attenuation radius is how far it's going to throw that light. So if I bring this down to, let's call it 500 and a half, we'll see that most of the light is where it starts and it's decreased the amount of distance that it throws the light. So you think of an attenuation radius is how far the radius is out from its point in space. That's your attenuation radius. Okay, how far it's gonna throw the light. That's always fun to play around with because not only does it change the distance, it also changes the softness of the shadows. If I put that back to where it was, we'll see not only is it brighter, we've got harder shadows around everywhere. So playing with the intensity often isn't what you want to do. Typically, it comes down to the attenuation radius, and when we get to the spotlight, it comes around to the cone angle as well. 
We've got things like the temperature. So say if I brought that down to 3,500, take 3,000 Kelvin off, it's going to get significantly warmer. And then similar with the sun and other lights, we've got our volumetric scattering intensity, so we can also create fog and god rays off of our artificial lighting as well. Unlike twin motion, we have a significant amount of control inside the lighting. Those bits there that I've shown are the main elements you need to know. You can change your IES profile to a specific type of light. You can go, uh, if you Google IES lights, you can download some free lights and specific types of spotlights, specific types of lights um, from real spaces you can download. Not super necessary because you can really just control the elements you want to control from up the top here anyway. So as long as you're massaging these elements here, you'll be fine. Let's go ahead and turn that one off. We will grab now a spotlight instead. And what I'm going to do is just throw a spotlight over the top here. So once again, the spotlight is going to be dependent on where we put it inside the space. I'm going to go ahead and bring mine down over the top of this character. There we go. Unreal Engine is amazing when it comes to the darkness of space. One of the reasons I love it so much is because of the chiaroscuro effect. Now, with your spotlight, the height that you play with is effectively the same as changing the attenuation radius. So the further away you pull it, obviously the less light is going to make it to that distance. If you want to pull it down because there's something above, but then it's getting too bright, you simply change the attenuation radius. There we go to 500 or 400. And we see that it does the same thing. It's getting softer around the person. So if you've got something that is above them and it's getting in the way or there's a ceiling space, you can just bring your spotlight down closer and then massage the attenuation radius. Let's pull that back up. And I'm going to pull this up as well, just so we get a little bit more balance in the lighting, and a little bit more zone out there. If I change my outer cone angle, you're going to guess what happens here. But I really, I'm just adding more space in. So the spotlight allows you to control the end point of the lighting a lot more than what the point light does. But ultimately, it depends on what effect you're trying to achieve. And the last type of light is our rectangular light, exactly the same as in twin motion as well. So it's just throwing out a rectangle of light, which means you get a very specific direction of the lighting. So rather than throwing it out in a radius, it's gonna throw it out as a rectangle. As you can see, that's hard to do with all of my bizarre angles and geometries here. Nothing is straight, and so it doesn't really wanna sit very straight in here. That's probably the best shot I've got. But if you've got a flat wall, or if you've got a window that's not quite throwing enough light in, or you've got a skylight from above where you don't want to turn up too much ambient, and you don't want to turn up the sun, or you're using an HDRI, you can put a rectangular light there so that it throws light from a specific direction. So again, all we're doing is just moving this around. What you'll notice with my rectangular light is really it's creating a wall of light. So you notice this dark shadow behind here, and as I push it through, it pushes that wall of light through into the space. And so if I was to start it over here, we might say that there's a light behind us and it's throwing light down in that direction. The rectangular light is a little bit different. So we're not playing with a cone angle. We're playing with a width and a height. And that is because it's a rectangle. It doesn't have a cone. The attenuation radius does exactly the same thing. So it's just going to throw more distance if I increase that number. So 2,500. And we see that it throws more light out into the depth of the cave. Let's bring that back. Source width and source height is going to change not only how wide or high the light is, but similar to our cone shape before, it's also going to change the softness and the hardness. So if you were doing a key light on a character and you wanted to illuminate their face from the opposite angle of your sunlight or from the opposite angle of your lights above or whatever, you would put your rectangular light on that side of their face and then you would increase either the width or height so that it softens the light coming through. So for example, if I change this to 2000 as the width, we'll notice that it absolutely softens all of the light coming in here. So basically what it's doing is it's taking that intensity and instead of it being concentrated, it's now stretching it out and it dilutes it really, really impactful in changing the light quality. So if, for example, instead of doing that, I just decrease the intensity, it doesn't have the same effect. It still has a brightness of light in this part here. There's still a brightness of light and then it dissipates 
uh, unevenly around there. So watch what happens again. If I put that intensity back up, but change the source width instead, soften everywhere and homogeneous in terms of its softness. It doesn't have a peak in the front and then unevenly dissipate. It's soft everywhere. So they're two different looks. They're two different ways of putting light into the space. The rectangular light is easily the best for key lighting when you're bringing your light from the opposite direction of the primary source. Let's do a quick example of key lighting together. So say there's a bright light up the top of the hill there. We'll actually turn that down a little bit as well. Turn that down to four. And so what I want to do is I want to throw some key light onto the opposite side of the face there. Again, go back to the lighting lecture. If you're not sure what key lighting is, go back to the lighting lecture. So I'm going to grab my rectangular light. I'm going to throw it onto the side of the face there. It's currently going the opposite direction because that's how rectangular lights work. They go the opposite of the surface that you put it on. So you put it onto her face there. Then I'm going to hit E key for rotate. And I'm going to rotate that by 180 degrees. W to turn back to my widget there. And I'm going to pull it up a little bit because I want it to be at face height as the start of the radius around there. Of course, we're going to bring the intensity down. So let's bring that down to 1. Still too bright. 0 0.2. Too bright. But now what we're going to do is change the attenuation radius down to 200. And I'm going to bring the source width up. And you notice what happened as I bring the width up. It's changing the way the light interacts because it's softening that light, much like we did before with that homogeneous light. Just increasing that. And so if I turn that on and off now, we see that I've got our primary light from one side over there. And then we're just trying to add a little bit of key light onto the faces there so we can still see what's going on as if there's just some reflecting light coming back this way here. And we can see more of what the character's faces are and what they're doing. And we can massage that until we're happy with it. But that's probably about right. So I still want to be able to see the face of the mum kissing the child there. I'm pretty happy with that. Often with key lighting, we would change the color or the temperature of the light as well. So I can come down here. Probably won't change this too much. Let's try 5,000. Yeah, maybe something 4,000 is about appropriate. So your job now is to experiment with different types of lighting and see how they interact with materials, people, architectural details, everything inside your scene to create the most immersive architectural experience possible. One more thing in our lighting here we see because I've jumped from one level back into this level again that it now says lighting needs to be rebuilt and that is because I forgot one more step which you need to do as well whenever you add any new lighting in here, any of this stuff that you've added inside here, we must always make it movable. And that means anytime a new light comes in, it needs to be able to be moved. Otherwise, it always will have to be rebuilt every single time. And then you have to go back up to build GPU light mass and build all the lighting all over again. It takes forever to do that. We don't want to be doing that all the time. So as a final step, whenever you add any new lighting, just make sure you always triple check that you've got movable selected, changed it over from stationary. Otherwise, you have to rebuild everything all the time. Simple fix. That message has gone away now. Just have to change it over to movable. All right, as promised, we're back to our default materials direct from Rhino, and it's time to start adding materials. What I want to show you first up is inside your content folders, we've got the filter icon over here, and we can filter by materials, which will be helpful later if you want to find something. But you'll notice that there is already a bunch of materials that are inside here. Similar to twin motion, these are going to be your low resolution materials inside the model. You can use it for stuff that's in the background and in the distance, but to be honest, they're probably even worse than the low res twin motion. So I typically avoid all of these. I will go to quick school mega scans and bring in some proper materials. The only thing I would grab from here though is the water. So just type in water now that I'm in my materials filter and it gives me two types here. I'm going to go ahead and grab the ocean and that is going to fill in the water in there. And then we're going to go ahead and edit our materials. So what we need to do is click on the actual layer itself that has the material on it. Then go down to the material section in your details tab. Double click on that. That is going to open up a dialog box for us, which is this one here. And we'll notice this is quite a complex page full of lots of different nodes. Now that is mostly because this has movement to it. And as it moves, 
different things need to happen. That's the simplest way I can put it. I'll show you how to edit some of this sort of stuff in a much more basic material. It'll make a lot more sense when we're looking at something that doesn't have all of this movement going on. All I wanna do in my water material is just edit the colors. Or notice that this is quite dark. If I make this a little bit smaller, so I can bring it out on screen at the same time. Here we are, I just want to edit the color that we have inside here. So the right hand side is gonna be the darkness and then these two on the left are going to be the color itself. So I want slightly more blue as my color and then the darkness itself, I wanna bring it up a little bit. Uh, let's turn around a little bit, look from this side as well. What are we thinking? Mm-hmm. If I go up too light, it starts to look fake. Um, it doesn't have any depth to it. So I want to probably stay in the lower side and just make it a little bit more blue. And then I'm going to bring that to more of an aqua color and a little bit darker again. Yeah, maybe a little darker. Cool. I'm happy with that. And then this one here, I'm just going to change the color spectrum a little bit. So it's more of a blue at the peak rather than a green. And there we go. And that's all I want to edit for the ocean. Again, there's a lot more stuff inside there that we can play with. For now, that will be fine. Yes, we're going to save that and that will keep all the settings there. Cool, so that's our water material, pretty straightforward. We're just using the water inside Unreal Engine. Now what we wanna do is add some materials inside of these spaces using Megascan. So we're gonna get out of here, we're gonna get out of this filter as well so we can uncheck that. There we go, we're back to where we were. What we then need to do is go up to here, our little content box, and then click on Quixel Bridge. Give that a little bit of time to load. If you haven't logged in already, it will ask you to log in with your Epic Games. And Quixel Bridge is exactly the same process as in Twinmotion. So we need to navigate to what we're looking for. For me, I want a plus three kind of texture. So I'm gonna go into my surfaces and then I'll find a plaster texture. I'm gonna zoom through this because we've already talked about it in the materials in Twinmotion lecture. Once we found one we like, we click on highest quality, and then we're gonna click on download. Give that a second to download. Cool, once that's downloaded, click on add, and then give that a second. And you just want to minimize bridge, and then voila, we'll see we have a new folder inside here. So if this didn't open automatically for you, if you go back out to your content drawer, back out to the main content, you should notice there's a new folder inside if you haven't already added any mega scans. There should be a new folder called mega scans. Click on that. Now we haven't downloaded any assets or anything else yet. We've just done surfaces. So there's a surfaces folder and we've only downloaded one material, but this is where all of your materials from Quixel mega scans will come in here inside folders. Each one will have its own folder because within the folder we have the material and all of the information about the material. Remember, think back to your materials lecture and you'll understand what each one of these does. To start adding the material, we simply drag and drop the material instance. Don't use the texture, use the material instance and you can start going ahead and adding that to all of your different materials around. And that is the process. Now, as I said before, if you've joined everything together in Rhino so that it's all just one static mesh or all just one object coming through, it will allow you to just drag and drop the material once. If you want to be able to edit them all later and you want to keep them all individual, therefore you don't want to join them together, you just have to do what I'm doing and go around one by one dragging and dropping the material onto that. So I'll go ahead and zoom through this now, adding all of the materials where they need to be. So there we go, I've got all my vaults done and I've just downloaded two more materials as well. So I'm gonna put this marble down here, another one over here on the back wall, on these columns. Obviously I would put more materials in than this, but just to get through it quickly. And there's another one down the back. And then our brass texture. Right, so as we mentioned before, once the materials are added in, it's really gonna change the way the lighting looks. And so as predicted, 
when I was saying before that the lighting was getting close enough. Now that we've added the materials, now that we have proper reflections coming from our high resolution materials, it does actually change the way the lighting looks and feels inside this space. It feels significantly better than it did before. It also, now that I've added this material into the floor and around the place, has changed the way the water looks and feels. The lighting's bouncing around a lot. And to me, that's a little bit too bright. So I'm just going to bring that back a little bit closer to what it was, make that a little bit darker. This all comes down to just massaging things. So as you improve, you're just continually moving it around. So as you add more information, you're continually adjusting things until they're starting to make more sense together as a collective whole. So it's actually turned out significantly closer to what it was when we first started, which is fine. We're learning more information and we're changing and adjusting as we go as necessary. Another thing I wanna show you before we look at how to edit the materials is how you can change your view to make sure you're looking at the final version of the materials before you make any decisions. So if we come up to the hamburgers up here, you notice that the screen percentage is actually pulled down and that's to help my graphics card, making sure that it's not working too hard. I'm on a 4K monitor and I'm screen recording this at the same time. So it's pulled down significantly. Yours might not pull down as much as that. If I were to bump this up to 150, give that a second. We'll notice that the light gets a lot sharper, the materials get sharper, and the features generally get a lot sharper. So what I want you to do is before you start to make any decisions about how much to change your materials or what to change, make sure you increase the screen percentage first to see what it's going to look like, then bring it back down and make your decisions based on that. Try not to do any editing while you're up at a high screen percentage because it is much more likely to crash while you're working. So I would then bring that back down to 64. We'll notice how our reflections, our smoothness and all that sort of stuff has dulled down quite significantly now compared to 150, but at least I can make some informed decisions about what changes I need to make. And another thing you can do to change the screen settings before you make any decisions is if you come up to the settings tab over here and you come down to your engine scalability settings. This is very similar to control P in tw twin motion changing the properties. Low, medium, high, epic, cinematic obviously is gonna give you uh, different levels of experience depending on your machine. So I'm running an epic at the moment, looking pretty good. Uh, we can go all the way down to low, looks terrible, medium, pretty bad as well. I'd say high and epic is what you want to be looking for. If you're not able to use either high or epic for all of them, what you can do is experiment with putting some of these on low slash medium that aren't affecting too much of what you're trying to edit. So for example, if you're trying to edit just the materials at that particular point in time, then bringing the foliage down to low isn't going to make any difference to you. So experiment with your settings in here if you're struggling. Otherwise, if you can, have it on either high or epic while you're working. If you can get to cinematic, good on you, well done. And then one last thing, before we look at editing materials, I will get there, I promise, is just changing the reflection settings in here, making sure that inside your post-process volume, you are using lumen reflections. So we've got a couple of different options here, screen space and standalone. By default, it should be on lumen, but I just want you to double check that you are using lumen reflections inside there. So all you need to do is go to your post-process volume, type in lumen, I'll do it again with you here, and then just scroll down to where it says reflections, click on method, and then it should uh, be lumen, and then we've got our quality settings in here. At the moment, I've got it default to one. Don't need it to be on too high. You can bump that up again if you want your reflections to be a little bit smoother. We can see mine are a little bit jagged at the moment, but perfectly reasonable to see uh, enough of the materials and whether or not they're going to be working for me. So I'm just going to leave them on one for now, but that is how you edit that if you need to later. All right, let's go ahead finally and have a look at our editing of materials. So first trick I wanna show you is if we get rid of that lumen thing, is if we have a material and we're all the way out in our content drawer and we don't wanna go all the way back through and navigate through Megascans because we wanna be able to find it. If we click on an object that already has the material you want, go over to the details tab and then click this little magnifying glass here it will take you directly to that material in the content drawer. So, so useful. So if I want brass, I click on that that's already got brass. Click on the magnifying glass, it takes me to brass. If I want my vaults, that stuck in material, click on that and it brings me to there. So handy. To edit the material itself, in the material section of the details tab, simply double click on the icon for the material. 
that will bring up this dialog box. We've got a simple version of the dialog box, which is this one here, and a more complicated version. Let's go through the simplified version first. So in this simplified version, we've got all of the settings that we've already looked at in the materials lecture. We've got our, whether or not it's metallic, the specular, the roughness, i.e. how reflective it is or not reflective, the normals, how much they come out of the material. We've got a tint, so if I wanna add a tint of color to it, we can change around the maps. We've got a few more settings that we don't have here in twin motion that we can play with. And the beauty of Unreal is it updates in real time. So let's say for example, I wanted to play with the reflectivity of this material. So what I can do is I can click on the max roughness and I can change this instead of 0.4, which is quite rough. So it doesn't have a lot of reflection. If I bring that down to 0.1, we'll see that it started to add some reflectivity into the material in there. Because we have a max and a min, it is a lot more realistic in a material. So reflections in a material like this, it wouldn't be the entire surface is reflective in reality. There'd be bits of the surface that are more reflective than others, like we can see on the sphere here. So this again is what helps us get closer to photorealism because we can play with things like max and mins rather than just an overall whitewash of the one material. All of these should be familiar to you, pretty straightforward. Play around and experiment with those. The main ones you're going to use, of course, is changing the tint of the color, changing the reflectivity, changing the normal strength, and pretty much everything else you can leave as default. One thing to know with our tinting, if we turn that on and jump into here, and William Forscher talks about this a lot, is that there is no such thing as a pure white material in reality. And so what you'll find is in the materials that you downloaded at Megascans, it's already built in for you. So even though this is a white material, the light factor, this V number here, is set to 0 0.85. Now, typically that is actually the maximum. You can break that if you want to and bump this up to a full white, but just know that that is not consistent with reality. And what he will also tell you is that a gray is not actually 0 0.5. So it sounds contradictory, but we can even tell that that still looks more white than it looks like a middle gray. So middle gray is actually 0 0.18. Now that would be halfway between the white in quotation marks and the black. So think of it as black is going to be zero. We've still got light bouncing around, so it's not going to be a true black. It's got reflectivity, so this is accurate. Black would look like this, given this current light condition. 0 0.18 is what a middle gray would look like, and then 0 0.85 is what a white would look like in this material. So think of that when you're setting your tints, that those are your ranges to play within zero, 0 0.18 and then 0 0.85 is going to be your ranges to play within. So it looks realistic in terms of how the light works with it. Now that is all of the basics. If we want to get a little bit more complex and start to play around with the scale of the material, we have to get further into what's called the hierarchy. So as promised, I said I was going to take you through some of these inside here. Right click is to pan around, by the way, if you want to pan through there. This is where we've got more of our settings enabled. So we've got our things that we do recognize, which is our textures, the metalness, ARD, the normal maps, the albedo map. We recognize all of that stuff. The tiling is where we can change the scale of our material. So if we double click on tiling, that's going to open up our tiling settings. And then what we're looking for is the coordinates itself. So if we jump up to coordinates, open this little tab in here, we can see I've got a U direction scale and a V direction scale. So all I need to do is go and adjust this. I'm gonna do an extreme change so we can see it in there. I'm gonna bump that one up to one and I'm gonna bump this one up to one as well. And then I click on save. And we'll notice that is now updating in real time over here on the model. If we give that a second to load and we'll see that it's got significantly smaller inside there. So if we want to make it bigger, we can go 0 0.01 on the other extreme, 0 0.01, click on save, give that a second to load, and we can see that it's gotten significantly bigger. So all we really need to do inside this one here is massage the texture coordinates until it is the right scale for you. I'm pretty happy with where it was already, so I'm going to go 0.09, which is just off what it came in at, as 0.01. 
and I click on save and there's my texture looking pretty realistic but I've made it just ever so slightly bigger 10% bigger so that I've got a little bit more of it when I'm standing close enough to it I can see what's going on when we're happy with that click on save and we can close out of the tiling on the other side over here we've got our adjustments if we want to double click on that one there is a lot more we can play with so some of these items here you'll recognize so the base color we can change how metallic it is the roughness slash reflectivity of it specular opacity the normals and the ambient occlusion each one of those now has its own specific node that we can start to edit and play with so we could have a look over here we could change the normals if we want to change the strength of it of how much it is coming out let's say for example we want to change this to 10 to make it more extreme we'll see that it gets really quite intense with how much the normals are jumping out of the material there and that's because I put it up to 101 let's bump that down to 10 and we'll see the difference there as it starts to soften a little bit so that is how we can bump up our texture a bit more so that it sits a little bit more aggressively on the screen again I still think 10 is too much for me so I can bring that down to 5 and that's probably getting a little closer. What I like is on the inside here, where that sunlight is softly dissipating down to there, we get a sense of that texture catching that light in there, which I'm happy with. And then the roughness, which is sitting above that, again, we've got just a little bit more control of what we were looking at before, but I'm happy with the zero and four that we set up earlier. And that is all that we really need to look at. I just want you to know that you have a lot more control inside the internal nodes and you can start to play around with what the material really feels like and looks like for you. All you really need to play with is probably the normals and the roughness and maybe changing around the color. Other than that, everything else you can do inside this simplified version of the settings over here. When you're done, click on save and then you can close out of that. And there we go, that is how we edit our materials. What we need to do though is make sure that we're being careful. For example, if my camera shot was gonna stand with something like this really close, we might think to ourselves, actually that normal is up way too high. It's looking way too textured for me. Or you might like that amount of detail. Or you might decide to use an aperture that blurs out whatever's in the foreground anyway. So remember, all of these things are impacting each other. The materials, the lighting, the camera composition, the way in which you put it all together, each one not only independently changes what's going on, but they all impact each other too. So just keep that in mind. All right, similar to materials, bringing out assets, exactly the same as twin motion. We're just importing things into our scene. So typically, we're going to do most of it from Quixel Bridge again. Instead of surfaces, we're going to have a look at some assets. Now, of course, with your assets, you've got all the stuff that we have in Twin Motion, the furniture and magazines and different artifacts that you can bring into the space. But the big thing about Unreal Engine is because we have Nanite inside Unreal Engine, which makes it easier for your computer to run it, we can look at bringing different landscapes and worlds into our environment. So say, for example, this... Uh, pool that I'm making I want it to be part of a snowy ice arctic landscape what I can do is I can go into this world and start downloading assets that conform to that universe so in Quixel Bridge inside the environments tab and then inside natural you'll see there's a whole range of different environments that you could start to download depending on your artistic vision things like a valley a tundra a tropical beach if you're in sandstone if you're in a quarry maybe you're in a wasteland uh, maybe you're in a dry grassland maybe the canyons of utah whatever it might be you can start to build on your environment that you're inhabiting by starting to cobble and collage these different elements together so typically you need a range so you need a floor material which is going to go over the top of the landscape that you've created. And then you start to put these three-dimensional objects over the top of that. So you'll notice how there's some flat bits that go onto the ground. There are some bits that come out a little bit more, but they still have that same outer material. So it'll go nicely into that ground material. And then you have some larger elements to place into the space as well. So that's just a matter of downloading them and adding them to your Unreal Engine project. Instead of the surfaces folder, it will go into your assets folder and then you'd just be able to drag and drop them into your scene. Very similar to what we already looked at in the Twin Motion video. So instead of doing that, what I'm gonna do is show you how you can use the power of Unreal Engine to add lots of assets at the same time. 
So as we can see here in this scene, in this cave, I've put a whole bunch of rocks all the way around this space so that this person would have to go over these uneasy rocks, travel through and get over to the other side over here. Now, of course, I could go to my Megascans folder, go to Assets, grab the rock and drag any of these into the scene one by one and just move them around. But that is not really harnessing the power of Unreal. We wanna make sure that things are done efficiently using the computing power. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna delete all of these rocks and we'll redo it again together. So there we are starting from scratch. So what you'll see in the background is exactly as I was explaining before, I've got a material that is within the same family of all of my rocks. So the rocks are gonna feel like they belong within that space and they're gonna blend in quite nicely. Then when I'm ready to go, I'm going to change over from selection mode into foliage mode. Now all foliage is doing is allowing us to paint multiple objects into a space at the same time. Now say for example in Epic Games in the marketplace I had downloaded a European horn beam which is just a bunch of trees basically. If you look through that it's going to give you a whole bunch of trees. Then I just add it to my project. If I jump back to the project I've got the European horn beams here, foliage and then a whole bunch of trees are inside there ready for me to go. So with my foliage editor, let's just make an example. I'm just going to track which one do I want? This one. Yeah, that's fine. So with foliage painter, we'll do a very quick example and then I'll go through it a bit more slowly. What it's doing is that it's allowing me to paint trees in so I can very quickly add a whole bunch of trees. Now I'm holding my mouse down so it's adding them back to back to back. There's heaps and heaps of trees there or I could do it more slowly and I could just very, very quickly dash those around. But the power of this is I can change the density, I can change the clustering so that I only need to click a handful of times and it adds objects in very, very quickly. So that's set up for trees at the moment, but we can turn absolutely anything into foliage. So let's get rid of all of that and I'm gonna remove the tree and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my mega scans find my rocks and I'm going to turn them into foliage so that they can then be painted into a scene just like trees. So the first thing I'm going to do inside my assets folder is just filter this down to the static meshes only so that we don't get distracted by all of the other bits. Also so that we can see all the rocks at the same time without having to go from folder to folder. Now what I want to do is I'm going to create a new foliage. So right click inside here foliage and we want a static mesh foliage and then I'm just going to call this canyon rock one then we double click on that new foliage we've created and we simply grab any one of these rocks so let's say I want this one here and we drag it up to the static mesh box in there and we are set and it's done great and then do that a few times get a few different rocks maybe four Probably don't need more than four to be able to make it look random. Once you've done that a few times, turn static meshes off. And then this time we're going to filter by our foliage. So click on foliage. And there we have it, there's our four rocks. Now what we need to do is grab each one of these and add it into the foliage type section. So we're gonna grab all four of those. There we go, we've got all four. Then we simply click on each of them in the left hand corner you'll see it's like it turns a light on so you know that it's selected you can deselect any of them if you only want to do one at a time that's fine we make sure we're on our paintbrush then what we're going to do is turn down the density let's change that to 0 0.1 and we're going to try that and see how that goes for our painting and that's looking interesting but still too much on top of each other We've got a couple of options. We can turn down the density even more. So let's try 0 0.05, so half of that again. And that will allow us to start painting them in. Yeah, that's pretty good. You'll notice it depends on the types of rocks that we've added into the scene as well, whether or not they're gonna have uh, little lumps or bumps or anything like that. Um, but I think this is working pretty effectively. We might need to change the scale of our rocks before we convert them to foliage, or we could just choose smaller rocks for our foliage. Another thing we can do if we're not quite happy with that is actually do the foliage one at a time. So you might say, I wanna do my little rocks first. So I'll turn off everything except for the little rock. 
and then I'll start adding the little rocks into the space here and there. I'm going to go all the way around and just cover the ground with the little rocks. You might want to increase your density when you're doing the small stuff first. So let's go 0.1 and that'll allow me to bring a few more in. Great. Don't worry, it's going to look more random once the next batch comes through. Cool. Then we turn that back off. We add the next one on. We could start painting some of them in. We might want to increase the density a little bit more again. And then another thing we can do if that's going too slowly for us is just increase the brush size a little bit. So if I bump that up from 100 to 1000, I can get a whole bunch of these all done at the same time. And again, if I want more density, if that's still not working for me, I can just bump that up. All right. Then we're happy with that one. Move on to the next one. Try that current brush, might be too big. Or it might be perfect. And there we go. The next phase is actually going back through and starting to erase some of the ones that we don't want. So then we just need to change from the paintbrush to the erase brush. And then we'll go and have a look around and see where there are rocks that we don't want rocks. So here's a good example. We've got rocks all the way up here. We do not want them on top of that. So I'm going to bring my brush size down so that I don't accidentally delete everything. And here we go. I can just go around and click on these and that will get rid of those. I can take them off. These ones over here as well look a little bit weird, a little bit random. So we can just click those off, get rid of that. And we'll just slowly go around the space deleting all the stuff that we don't want so that it to make sure that it looks accurate. Then once we've done that, we change back from folio mode to selection mode and we can navigate through our space. And what we would do then is identify areas where we might need to do some individual rocks. So say for example, I didn't want to have this little bit of floor space down there. I could go back into my static meshes and just add one asset rock inside that space. So what using the foliage tool does for us is it allows us to very, very quickly apply a lot of assets into the one space. Now, I've done this for rocks for my cave, but you can see how you could apply this to anything. If you want a huge forest of trees very, very quickly, you could do that. If you want to do a landscape which looks random, it's got a bunch of different flowers and grasses and all sorts of different shrubbery. You could just add them all to your foliage, change the density, and just paint them all around the space so it feels a lot more organic. It feels like it's a natural space that's coming through. So using the foliage tool to bring your assets in not only makes it faster, but it also makes it feel more realistic as well. And that is how you bring your assets in from Quixel Bridge, either using the static mesh one at a time, or convert them into foliage and paint a whole bunch of them on there. Easy as. Onto landscape now, pretty straightforward. Let's jump down to a different view. On that note, to set up some easy views, what I like to do is I just come over to here, go create a camera here, create camera actor. Then that'll come up in your tab. So this is the one we're in at the moment. Um, you don't need these obviously in the model pathway, but I just find it really handy to have them ready to go. Because what I can do is I can come up into here, right click, snap view to object, and that will allow me to jump from place to place. So I don't have to navigate there all the time, it makes things way faster. You notice in my naming conventions as well, I do zero, zero first, and that way my cameras are always sitting up at the top, and that way I can get to them really quickly. So let's jump down to landscape shot so we can add some landscape in and I'm going to turn off the fog for a bit so we can see what we're doing. Cool. So super basic at the moment, only three materials in the site, but we get the idea. So adding landscape in pretty straightforward. We change from selection mode, very similar to foliage, but this time we're going to go to landscape. Then what we need to do is we're going to create a new landscape inside of here. So it's going to ask us a couple of questions. First thing, now that I'm going upwards, I can see where the landscape is going to sit. And we've got two options. We can create a landscape that fits within a specific zone and we can just change the size of that. Or probably more typically what we'll do is we'll fill the entire world with it. And that way in all directions, it's going to fill it out for us. And because it's Unreal Engine, it knows to make this stuff which is close to us in high resolution, all the way to nothing resolution down at the end. So it's not going to take up too much computing power to do it. 
up to you. If you've got a big empty hole like this, it might even be easier to create a separate landscape outside, who knows? Totally up to you. What you need to do is just add a material. So again, in your mega scans, when I talked about the environment and the natural environment or the wasteland, whatever it is you choose, there'll be a material that is grouped with those assets so that they start to conform with that. So I've downloaded in my mega scans in my surfaces tab, I've got the rocky ground, which came with all of those rocks and boulders. Then you simply grab the material, drag it into the materials section. And then all you need to do from there is click on create. It will take a while to load. And of course, make sure you save everything before you do this, as this can crash some machines. When you're ready, click on create, and I'll zoom ahead to when that's finished. There we go, all done. And we can see our material goes off infinitely into the horizon. So it's kind of created this really interesting desert effect. Now, fortunately for us, the landscape behaves very similarly to what it does in twin motion. So by default, you will be already started with a brush in the sculpting settings and we click and that is gonna bring things upwards. If we hold down shift while we're clicking, it's gonna push things downwards. And if we keep on going, it's going to push the space down more and more and more until we can reveal what is hidden below. Unreal Engine is pretty good at handling the materials that you warp by pushing them and sculpting them around. So you notice that even though we've got quite a steep angle down here, the texture is still handled pretty effectively. It's not being stretched and you'll have a lot less stretching than you would if you were doing the same exercise in twin motion. You've got your brush type, you've got your tool strength, you've got your brush size, all of that stuff pretty straightforward. You've also got other more complex things like hydro, which simulates erosion caused by rainfall, which you can start to brush in to get some different effects going on there as well. Pretty interesting. So you can have a play around with that. Really, really very straightforward in terms of adding your landscape, not too dissimilar from what we've already done in the previous lectures. But the fun part of Unreal Engine, once we've done all that landscaping and we're happy with it, is we can jump over back into foliage mode and simply start painting in some rocks or some trees. And we can make that really quite a believable landscape with all of the assets that we add in. On that note, one more thing I wanna show you now that we have a landscape in here is when we're adding our foliage in, you may find that when you have a landscape that's more vertical, you aren't able to paint your foliage in. It skips a gap so where it's horizontal or mostly horizontal it will lay down your foliage but then when it goes to vertical it doesn't put it in and that's difficult if you want to put things on walls very difficult if you want to put things on ceilings but it's pretty straightforward to fix so if you go onto the foliage that you're trying to add in scroll down a little bit into your placement section you want to make sure your align to normals is turned on so that if you're trying to go onto a ceiling it will align it to that ceiling then from there, we just want to change our max angle. So at the moment, this is on zero, which means it only likes to work on flat planes. And then our ground slope angle, we can bump that up to 180 as well. Basically, this is just telling Unreal Engine, no, I don't mind if it's not on a perfectly flat plane. I'm happy to make for my trees to be hanging from the ceiling, that kind of thing. Because remember, it's about adding plants in. So now that allows us to add things on the horizontal. That's our bigger rocks. Then we have to go and do the same thing for the smaller rock into the smaller rock, down here, align to normal is already on. We're gonna change our max angle to 180, and we're gonna change our ground slope angle to 180 as well. And then we can go ahead and paint those in, and we'll see that they all come through now on that vertical wall. And so using that technique, you'll be able to paint on verticals, and you'll be able to paint on a ceiling as well, anything that has been added to foliage. And remember, foliage isn't just trees, it is any static mesh, any asset that you want to be able to paint a lot of them in, you can do that by converting them to foliage first and then just brushing them in. So this way you can paint in any direction now. All right, everybody, that is it for video lecture two on the ArcViz techniques of Unreal Engine. Our next video, video lecture three, is going to be looking at camera direction. And you might be thinking, ah, I'm in the model pathway. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to video lecture four. It is really important that you understand how cameras work, 
how we can place them, and how we can set up their settings to make things look really, really good. There's no point in doing all of this work that you've done in this video for ArcViz to make things look good if you then have a rubbish looking camera. So even if you're not in the film pathway, even if you're model interactive pathway, it's very important that you do still watch Video Lecture 3 and you get a good understanding of what makes a beautiful shot, a beautiful camera. Plenty to get excited about in the next video, but that is all for now. Happy modeling.